All right, I think we're gonna get going and if others join us, uh, even better. So thank you for participating today. Really appreciate your time. Uh, here today, we're going to be talking about some state and federal funding opportunities for hemp businesses. That includes whether you're a hemp farmer or whether you're a CBD processor or extractor or potentially even a CBD retail business. A little bit about myself and my co-presenter. My name is Michelle Bodian. I'm a senior associate attorney in the hemp and cannabinoid practice group uh, with my law firm, Vicente Cedarberg. And my co-host is Eric Steenshaw, who is the president of Vote Hemp. Um, a little background on where we come from and you know what we do in the space. Uh, my background, I was with the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources for about five years. Prior to that, I was employed as a private sector attorney with a law firm, but my time in government service in Massachusetts really gave me some insights into how the government procurement process works. We'll talk about that later, some tips and tricks. Uh, I've been working in this hemp and cannabinoid space for a few years now, advising primarily hemp and CBD clients on the complex and interconnected federal, state, and local regulatory framework. Eric has been in this hemp industry for, I don't want to age you there, but God knows how long. You've been involved practically since the beginning. Um, you know, co-founding a hemp clothing and lifestyle brand, and then a founding member of HIA, the Hemp Industries Association, and you serve from, as executive director for several years. And you now, in your current role, are president of Bo Hemp, which is most, if not everyone in this hemp space knows, it's a political advocacy organization. You co-founded it in the year 2000. Um, and you're also the vice president of the California Hemp Council. You speak all over the country on so many platforms, um, you know, print media, digital. You've been featured in CNN, New York Times, uh, Rolling Stone, Forbes, you know, just to name a few. I could keep going, uh, but really excited to have you join me today on this panel. I think we're going to be able to share a lot of really important information. Really appreciate your time. Um, the lawyer in me needs to give a disclaimer about the information we're about to share in general. Uh, always double check your eligibility, you know, grants and loans, the criteria can change at a moment's notice just because you're eligible when we put these slides together does not mean you're gonna be eligible, uh, you know, when you do go to apply. This is just general information. Like I said, please confirm before you apply for anything. Reach out to Eric and I, we're here to answer any questions, any follow-ups. So yeah, let's get going. I'm going to turn it over to Eric to do just kind of an overview of the general legal status of hemp before we dive into some particulars. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, great to be here with you today. And thanks to everybody for joining. And uh, uh, yeah, I'll dive right in. We're going to start with just a brief background on uh, status of, uh, of industrial hemp. Uh, many of you may know about this, but I'll just cover it real quickly here. So in um, up until 2014, uh, the federal law did not distinguish between hemp and marijuana. The cannabis plant was all considered to be marijuana, and it was not legal to grow it, uh, except that there were some uh, exceptions to allow for the import of uh, processed parts, certain parts of the plant, primarily the fiber from the stalk and the, and the other parts of the stalk, as well as uh, seed, as long as it was incapable of germination. But in 2014, when the, uh, or actually 2013, when the previous farm bill was being uh, brought up for consideration, there was an open floor amendment process and uh, Representative Polis from Colorado was able to, uh, to put in an amendment that allowed for university research initially. And um, uh, fortunately, the number of years of work uh, finally paid off. We got 162 Democrats and 63 Republicans uh, to put together 225 votes, just enough to get a, an amendment passed that farm bill to give a definition to hemp and to allow for this university research. After the bill crossed over into the Senate uh, it uh, and then ultimately into the conference where the two houses work out the differences between their bills, uh, Senator McConnell was able to work some, uh, some magic there to expand the definition a little bit to include pilot programs and allow departments of agriculture to participate as well. So it was a research program on hemp that allowed for research under the authority of uh, departments of agriculture, but you know, including universities. And so that was our uh, so-called nose under the tent that got us started. And uh, 
it, it remains in effect until the uh, October of this, the end of October this year. Um, so um, we had five years of uh, farmers being able to plant and work with the crop, created a lot of excitement and demand, a lot of uh, uh, interest in the crop and research as well. And in 2018, uh, as Congress was looking at the Farm Bill again, uh, this was brought up in Senator McConnell and Senator Wyden, as well as some of the House members pushed to get this included as as a, uh, to take it from being research and pilot programs to full commercial. And so the provision was added to the 2018 Farm Bill, removed all parts of cannabis plant as long as it contained three tenths of a percent THC or less from the Controlled Substances Act. So it was completely removed from that. It moved it from uh, under the authority of the DEA to the USDA. Uh, it categorized it as an agricultural commodity. Uh, and um, that also authorized tribal governments to participate, uh, which weren't explicitly included in the 2014 uh, version of the bill. So um, by uh, USDA worked very quickly uh, after it was signed into law by the president on uh, December 20th of 2018. Uh, the USDA moved very quickly and they issued uh, regulations, uh, interim final rule in October uh, 31st of 2019 that would allow for states to submit programs that could be uh, states and tribes and territories all could submit programs to be approved. USDA had a 60 day period. They could, uh, they could look to approve those. And then once the state or territory or tribe had an approved plan, they could then regulate the production of hemp uh, under that, under the new bill. So, um, you know, under, under 2018 farm bill, as we said, hemp is treated as an agricultural commodity, just as any other crop would be, uh, with the exception that there's licensing specifically through these state and tribal programs. Um, so, uh, one of the most important provisions lies in section, uh, 101, uh, it includes, some specific uh, protections for farmers under the Federal Crop Insurance Act. And uh, we'll talk more, uh, more about this in a bit, but uh, crop insurance has become available in some uh, some situations, not all yet. And uh, in addition, uh, hemp businesses are now eligible for federal, state, and local, local funding opportunities. This has been a huge shift for us. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Michelle. She can take it uh, and talk a little bit more about some specific uh, opportunities. Sure. So in general, you'll see on here the state and federal and local opportunities, as Eric talks about, you know, kind of breaking it down into several categories. On the federal side of things, there's USDA, there's the Department of Energy, um, you know, who has some particular focus on it as a crop. And then, you know, more broadly, the U.S. SBA, Small Business Administration, Economic Development Administration. Similarly, on the state level, there's Department of agriculture and this Department of Economic Development are the two primary agencies. Uh, on the local side, there's municipal development agencies and local uh, county development organizations. There's also a number of private opportunities. This today we're focused in this webinar on you know the government opportunities, but there are a number of private opportunities, most in the grant section, less so in the loan section. But some of those would be, you know, county farm bureaus or other technology and innovation uh, opportunities. Those really are driven by the private sector here today. We're going to talk briefly on a couple of states, Colorado, New York, Massachusetts. But in general, if you're looking for opportunities in the state where you're located at the state level or local level, you know, flip back to this slide uh, at the end. You'll all get a copy and you can really, you know, use this slide as the guide of where to start looking if you're looking for an opportunity and really encourage you to reach out to these uh, people. If you don't see anyone, any grants that are obvious or loans, you can reach out and ask if there's any opportunities or if there are any coming up soon. So this presentation is geared uh, more towards hemp and CBD related opportunities uh, in general, but a lot of the programs out there today are really geared more towards farmers. You know, this is a crop, this is what people are growing. And so the processing and business side of things is not quite as evolved. So today the opportunities in general are more favorable towards farmers. Uh, on the USDA side of things, they break their programs down into several, you know, essentially buckets. There's opportunities for funding. So opportunities uh, 
for capital to help fund your operation. Then there's funding opportunities to manage your existing operation, you know, mitigating risk and um, something like that would be the crop insurance and then conservation efforts. So opportunities to implement conservation practices for your operation. And you see those listed there. Um, some of those are environmental quality incentives program or conservation steward program. Sorry, technical, got a, too many uh, screens open. So then at the Federal Small Business Administration, there are a number of uh, specific loans just generally that are always available, 7A and 504 loan guaranteeing programs. And then there are some very specific COVID-19 uh, protection programs such as paycheck protection or economic injury disaster loans. You know, a lot of these you've been seeing press in the news today and hemp businesses are eligible for those types of opportunities. At the state level, uh, there are a variety of programs, organic cost share, farm energy discount, you know, if you're a younger beginning or new farmer, there's young farmer grant programs or general conservation programs, similar to the ones available at the federal level with USDA, but these are all programs to help launch, develop, or, or expand a business. And then at the local level, they're primarily tax credits, um, so opportunities to get relief from various local taxes or potentially state taxes, and then some community development loans. At the really hyper-local level, the organizations are looking to attract businesses to their town and their community. So they are very willing to work with you to try to see what financial incentives can be offered to bring your operation to their town. So how to actually apply for one of these opportunities, you know, really apply for programs you're eligible for and then you can meet all of the conditions. The information that they're soliciting is very detailed oftentimes and you really want to read through anything before spending your time to apply. You know, financial assistance is out there, grants, loans, like we said, federal, state, local, there is money out there and opportunities, but that doesn't mean it's as simple as, you know, filling out a quick, one page application and then waiting six weeks and getting your money. These are competitive processes and it does take time and effort on your part to apply and hope that you get these opportunities. And then the timing of it, if you're in a financial bind or you need the money quickly, these potentially are not programs for you. It's really best to be applying for these grant and loan opportunities when you have time to wait. Um, not necessarily time to waste, but at least time to wait uh, because these will not be processed quickly. You remember these are government agencies, whether it's the state, federal, local government, uh, especially now when most people are working from home and there's time delays. So it can take a while between the time you see a posting, you apply, they process your application and receive a decision to the point where you actually receive the funding. You know, this could take months. We're not talking weeks and we're certainly not talking days. So really make sure that you've budgeted and planned for the fact that you might not hear for a number of months. And like I said, program eligibility, it's very detailed what you're applying for and that can change. Deadlines can change, they can be extended, they can be moved up. You really need to monitor the information closely to make sure you're applying for accurate information and that they're able to process your application for the grant or loan. One tool that's out there to really help you as you're going through this process, uh, all government agencies are subject to some type of Freedom of Information Act or public records law that enables you as a member of the public to ask for and receive records. If you're applying for a grant or a loan that you know has been in existence for at least one year, if not five, 10 years, that means they've had applications, they've awarded these programs to other applicants in years past. If you have the time and you think one's coming, you know, ask these government agencies to provide you past applications. You could see how others framed it. You could see how they had attachments. You can see who won it. You could see the scoring criteria. There's a wealth of information that's you're entitled to for nominal costs. They usually charge for photocopying or their time, but you can just get so much valuable information by asking these agencies to provide the information that they had uh, you know, used or relied upon in past years. 
in general, when you're applying, make sure you provide all of the required information. Always read the fine print. Is a hard copy required? Do you need to submit electronic and hard copy? Do you need three copies? Just in general, make sure you understand what is required and that you can really deliver the necessary information. Ask questions of the person submit, uh, providing the grant and loan. You know, ask the Department of Agriculture if something's unclear. There's always a contact information listed. Oftentimes there's a question and answer section or question, frequently asked questions will be posted to the grant or loan page. You know, really engage in the process and make sure you understand what's being asked of you. And then obviously it's in, you know, both print there. Make sure you apply on time. If you miss a deadline, even by minutes, especially if it's electronic submission, you'll be locked out. They won't even consider your application. Remember, this is a competitive process and others who have gotten in on time, they'll be the ones being considered. So make sure you understand the deadline. Is it postmarked by 5 p.m.? Is it received by 5 p.m.? Is it an electronic de deadline, but a pipe or copy must also be received? You need to really make sure you understand what the deadline is and make sure you can comply with it. Also, as I said, be aware deadlines can change. Most often they're pushed out, they're very rarely moved forward, but make sure you understand what that deadline is. Then in general, write clearly. The people reviewing the material are ordinary people trying to do their job. So the easier you make it for them, the better. Typed application with visuals, if it's appropriate or easiest to read, something that allows the regulators to quickly skim the application Make sure you're asking, answering the question that was asked or the prompt. Don't be discouraged if you aren't awarded something on your first opportunity. There are new grant and loans being re released or eligibility criteria may change. You know, things do evolve in this space and you might have other opportunities and you can learn from what your experience was. And oftentimes if you write up information about your business and your business stays the same, you can use the same information over and over again. In general, hemp might not always be explicitly eligible for every grant and loan, but you should make sure that hemp is at least not ineligible. And that's kind of a nuanced distinction we'll get into a little bit later. There are very few grants out there today that are 100% geared towards hemp. Most often, as Eric said, this is now an agricultural commodity. So hemp is a crop that would be eligible to apply for this, like any other crop being grown or any other business. Now to get into some actual programs, which I'm sure what you're most interested in hearing about. I'm gonna turn it back over to Eric to get into some specific programs. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, so um, we'll start talking about a few of the programs that are out there that are available. Um, one, uh, one option with the USDA is loans for farm ownership or, or redevelopment. So. Um, these are loans that uh, that can can be accessed to purchase farmland, to construct or repair buildings, to um, even to do things like promoting soil conservation, soil and water conservation, uh, or to refinance debt on an existing farm. So there's a variety of uh, of options there. You need to look at the specific uh, you know programs to find out more details on these. But uh, generally, uh, these are available to anyone that's, uh, you know, farming. And, and the critical thing and it, uh, that we need to note, obviously, with hemp is that you've got to show that uh, you're fully uh, licensed. Uh, you have to have a state license and, and document that you've gone through all the correct processes and that you're following all the regulations and within, in requirements for that. So um, there's also farm operating loans. Uh, those can be used to again, to purchase equipment, uh, livestock, uh, chemicals, fuel, insurance, any kind of operating expenses that you might have on a, on a farm. Uh, uh, you can use them to pay for minor improvements. Uh, family living expenses even can be covered. Uh, and, and again, Rena free financing debt. So um, these can be structured loans or also as lines of credit, depending on the purpose and intended term of the loan. So, those are uh, the, there's a lot lot there. Um, USDA has released some new guidance on uh, on August 1st, just recently here, uh, outlining eligibility requirements for industrial hemp producers. So this is really important, uh, and I just mentioned that is that individuals have to be approved to produce hemp under the provisions either of the 2014 Farm Bill uh, or or also the 2018, and that they have to be eligible for FSA loan servicing assistance. So. Uh, for, for hemp income to be included in the projected cash flow or used with income, 
a contract is required. So if you're growing speculatively, if you don't know who's going to buy this, that may uh, you know eliminate you from eligibility. It's really important that uh, uh, that you have an, uh, an idea, not only an idea, but actually an agreement with someone to sell the crop. So that, that's critical. They want to see that so that they have an idea that the loan can be paid back. And then uh, for direct lo uh, loan contracts, uh, farm operating plans must be based on accurate and verifiable information. So they are going to go through your, your, your data to, sh to check it out and make sure it all makes sense. Um, and for guaranteed loan contracts, the plan has to be based on the applicant's record of production. Some people don't have much of a record with this yet, so that could be a challenge, but uh, they're ideally going to want to see some history, uh, you know, and a proven record of financial management. If you're an existing farmer or have had this business for a while, that helps uh, significantly to show that you have the ability to uh, manage this and that you're going to be a, a good, uh, you know, a borrower that will hopefully be able to pay back the loan. So um, those are really important. And then um, at the Farm Service Agency, uh, there's direct farm ownership microloans. Um, for these, you don't need a, an appraisal. Uh, there's uh, ver verification of non-farm income is unnecessary unless required to, to actually make your repayment. And successful repayment of an FSA youth loan may be used towards the required three years of management experience. So there's some specific requirements on those loans. Direct farm operating microloans also have some requirements. Uh, program allows for situations where production yield history is uh, or reporting is impractical, not relevant to proposal submitted or is not available. And um, modified farm managerial experience requirements accommodate smaller farm operations, beginning farmers, and those with no farm management experience that might be helpful for some uh, in the industry or newer small business experience plus any farm experience along with a self-guided apprenticeship is a way to meet the requirements. So, and then on the rates and terms, applicants can apply for microloans combining a total of up to 100,000 uh, and up to 50,000 for farm ownership loans and 50,000 for an operating loan. So those could be combined into one, a total of 100,000, but there's 50,000 limit on each. And then I got to turn this back over to Michelle. And I do want to let uh, those watching know that there is a chat function on this webinar and definitely feel free to type in some questions. We'll leave some time at the end. Um, and I see at least someone's used the chat. So appreciate, appreciate you figuring that out, whoever you are from Atlanta. So turning back to USDA, uh, Natural Resource Conservation Services, so NRCS conservation program. So these programs are really focused towards agricultural conservation. And you see uh, the four big ones listed there. So Environmental Quality Incentive Program, or EQIP. Every region within a state has identified a high priority area, and each of these will target up to three uh, priority resource concerns by land use. So whether it's minimizing uh, water issues or protecting soil, you know, each state will have identified priority areas that they're then looking to fund. In addition to the payment for practice implementation, so if you're doing implementing a conservation method, they will actually refund you for all the equipment and the time and effort related to implementing that. There are incentive contracts that offer annual payment to address operation and maintenance costs um, in, in instead of some income assistance there. The conservation stewardship program helps agricultural producers maintain and improve their existing conservation systems. And those are payments for conservation performance. Essentially, the higher the performance, the higher the payment you can receive. And those contracts are for a five-year period. The payment rate actually is tabulated based upon your region um, and based upon the, the practices and bundles. So it's a bit of a variable rate, but it can be paid per acre, per foot. You know, it depends how you're farming and what goes into that at the local level. The Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. So this you can get um, you know, essentially a one-time payment, but the catch with this program is you do need to actually put an easement on top of your property, preserving it in perpetuity for agricultural purposes. Um, and this is a new change now with the 2018 Farm Bill that if you are growing hemp on your property, you are eligible for this program. It didn't used to be an, an eligibility. Uh, it used to be an eligibility problem, but now hemp is eligible to apply for this. And then the last program, uh, you know, maybe less specific to you today, 
but just something to be aware of. It's a regional conservation partnership program and it promotes coordination between the federal NRCS and its partners at the state level. And under this partnership agreement, there are some opportunities to deliver standalone conservation assistance to producers of landowners. It used to be within a different program, it's now its own standalone program with its own funding of about 300 million annually. They're still trying to figure out how exactly to implement that program. So certainly on that one, um, the regional conservation partnership programs, more information is needed and some follow up, but you know, 300 million is certainly quite a bit of money. And so there will definitely be some opportunities there which hemp would be eligible for. And then turning it back over to the federal, uh, the SBA, Small Business Administration, Eric's going to talk about a couple other more general loan guarantee programs. Thanks, Michelle. So, yeah, the uh, SBA is another great resource for businesses as well as for farming operations. Um, SBA's main uh, lending program for small businesses is what's called the 7A loan guarantee program. Uh, and they work with uh, banks on that and essentially help to guarantee the loans and give banks the ability to make these loans. The maximum loan amount uh, they can do in those types of loans is $5 million. Uh, and, and the SBA guarantees 85% of the loans uh, of $150,000 or less. Uh, and then 75% guarantee on higher loans. And that helps to give the banks some, uh, you know, some additional ability to make those types of loans, having that backing, and then up to a total of 2.75 million max guarantee. So uh, you can use the proceeds for a variety of things. Uh, you know, it's term. It can be a term loan, expansion, or renovation. You can do new construction under that. You can purchase lands, land, or buildings, uh, equipments, and fixtures, uh, improvements. Uh, working capital, refinancing debt, if you have a compelling uh, reason, uh, seasonal line of credit, or uh, inventory of starting a business. It's important to keep in mind these are pretty still still standard loans. Banks are going to be looking that, you know, the loan makes sense and that, uh, you know, ideally you're going to have the ability to repay it still in order to make these loans. So um, uh, in some other details about the 7A uh, maturity, it depends on your ability to repay. Um, generally, a working capital and machinery uh, not to exceed the life of the equipment, so typically five to ten year term. And in real estate, you can obviously get longer terms, um, and uh, those loans because they're obviously backed by a by a piece of uh, property there. So uh, interest rates are, are favorable. Um, so on loans of less than seven years, you can see that the rates go down depending on the uh, the uh, the total, but it's prime plus. Uh, you know, two and a quarter up to four and a quarter. So those are those are decent rates on on business lending. And then for longer loans, you've got options as well that are slightly higher interest rates. And then uh, no fee, no SBA fees on loans of 150 thousand or less uh, was approved in in 2014. Uh, the fee charged on guaranteed portion of loan only. Um, so 150 to 700 thousand is a three percent fee, and then uh, 700,000 to a million, it's a three and a half percent fee. Uh, in addition, there's a 3.75 on guarantee portion over a million. So for the larger loans, uh, and there's some ongoing fees, but you definitely want to consult with the banker about this to, to confirm any of these details. Um, so qualifications, who qualifies? Um, you've got to be a for-profit business uh, and meet SBA size standards. Um, and again, you can inquire on, you know, through the S, through a banker, really, you want to find a bank uh, on the SBA's website, they have a list of banks that work with SBA. So they will be able to give you more details and really answer a lot of additional questions on that. Uh, they want to see that you've, you know, show good character, uh, that you've got credit management skills, and, and that they believe you have the ability to repay the loans. These are not grants. So they are looking at you know, viable business models here where people, where they feel like uh, people are going to be able to uh, be successful. Uh, and you have to be an eligible type of business. Uh, there are some limits there. Um, prepayment penalty for loans with maturities of 15 years or more. Sometimes they might charge a little extra if you pay it early. Uh, and then what are the benefits to borrowers? So, uh, you know, because of the SBA's guarantee, you've got banks are more willing to make these loans. There's long-term financing for you. And it can help you with improving your cash flow. Uh, you've got a fixed maturity. Uh, the loans don't balloon, 
and uh, no, often many of the loans have no prepayment penalty, so under under 15 years. And um, so then there's a, SBA has a 504 guarantee, loan guarantee program. This is provided through certified development company uh, companies. Uh, those are uh, also licensed by the S SBA. Uh, similar loan amount, slightly higher, five and a half million maximum loan amount. Uh, the guarantee is a little different. Uh, you can see there on CDC, it's up to 40%. Uh, and with the lender, it's 50% or non-guaranteed. And then, uh, you know, use of proceeds, long-term fixed asset loans, right? So these these are, that that's, that's primarily it, but there's also... Uh, lender financing secured by first lien on project assets. So if you've got real estate or other significant assets, that's a possibility. And then CDC loan provided from SBA are 100% guaranteed debenture that are sold to investors uh, at a fixed rate. So um, maturity CDC loans range from 10 to 20 years, uh, fixed interest rate. Uh, a lender loan, so those are unguaranteed financing and they have a shorter term. Uh, maybe fixed or adjustable interest rate. So, and then the maximum interest rates, it's a fixed rate on a five four loan established by a, a debenture backing loan is sold. So it depends on the, the buyers of the loan there. And then there's some fees, some guarantee fees, half a percent on the lender share, plus CDC can charge up to 1.5% on their share. And CDC charges a monthly servicing fee as well. Um, and uh, ongoing guarantee fee. So there's some fees involved with these types of loans. Uh, you need to look into the specifics on that uh, if you're interested in pursuing that and uh, who would qualify. So uh, alternative size standard, it's a for-profit business again. They can't exceed more than 15 million in tangible net worth. And they don't uh, have an average uh, two fiscal, uh, full fiscal years of net income over 5 million. So still, still essentially in the smaller, smaller to smaller, you know, to size businesses. Uh, owner occupied, um, fifty-one percent for existing or sixty percent for new construction. And <clears throat> what are the benefits? Uh, low down payment uh, and, and equity. There, the equity contribution can be borrowed as long as it's not from an SBA loan. Uh, so you might be able to get that from another source. The fees can be financed and. Uh, the, the SBA CDC portion alone, you've had a long-term fixed rate, full amortization, and again, no balloons. <clears throat> so now we're going to move into talking a little bit more about a couple of select state programs. Obviously, there's a lot of states out there. We couldn't cover them all, but wanted to highlight a few for you. So um, I'm going to start off the first one here in, uh, in, in Colorado. The uh, Colorado Housing and Finance Authority. <clears throat> has a CCS program, the Cash Collateral Support Program, uh, creates access for capital, small, medium-sized businesses that are operating in Colorado and having trouble securing credit <clears throat> due to shortfalls in collateral. Uh, the program provides cash as collateral for a business loan or credit facility when a business cannot meet the lender's collateral requirements. So uh, CCS, a, a cash deposit typically of less of 25% of the loan amount or 250,000 is pledged as an additional collateral, collateral, excuse me, to lenders to help business borrowers meet the lenders' collateral requirements. So the state's going to help, sort of, in in, in, a, in a way to secure that loan. Uh, and Michelle, if you want, I'll let you take it from on this next slide here. I think. Sure. Um, so another Colorado state program, Colorado sales and use tax exemption for manufacturing equipment, and this is through the Colorado Department of Revenue. Uh, purchasers of eligible machinery or machine tools or parts thereof, they're exempt from state sales and use tax when the machinery will be used in manufacturing. Uh, qualifying equipment must be used directly and predominantly to manufacture tangible personal property for sale or profit. Um, and beyond that, uh, if located within a specific enterprise zone, so Colorado breaks uh, the state into enterprise zones, which gives you additional benefits. Um, the exemption would be broader and includes materials for construction or repair of manufacturing equipment. Um, and the equipment does not have to be capitalized to qualify. To claim this exemption, uh, there's a particular form, a sales tax exemption on purchases and machinery, machine tools form, uh, cleverly titled, and you can be able to fill that out 
as directed. Then there is also the Colorado Strategic Fund Grant Program, and that's through the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade. The program offers performance-based incentive, uh, incentivizes commitment to eligible businesses, making a significant capital investment that creates new and full-time permanent jobs, paying at or above the average county wage. Uh, that cash incentive can range from about 2,000 to 5,000, uh, per net new full-time job created based on average wage. So this program, actually both these programs, if you're on the processing manufacturing side of the hemp industry and you're located in Colorado, these would be some great opportunities to look into. A lot of states have similar programs. So just because you're not located in Colorado, certainly look into, as I said back in that beginning slide, Office of Economic Development or Trade or your local Department of Revenue might have similar opportunities in whichever state you're located. Massachusetts jumping away from the manufacturing side of things and back to the farmer side of things. Uh, there is a grant opportunity. It's an organic cost share program that's with the State Department of Agriculture up in Massachusetts called the Department of Agricultural Resources. So it works with USDA collaboratively to reimburse uh, certified organic farmers and food processes up to 75%, $750 max for the total certification cost to be certified organic. Um, and you see um, farmers must be inspected and certified in order to receive these funds. Organic operations certified for crops, wild crops, and handlers. Operations can receive, uh, you know, one reimbursement per certificate or category. And then in New York, um, you know, you may wonder why we're highlighting an opportunity that's not currently funding, but we did want to highlight the fact that some states are coming on board and creating hemp specific opportunities. So we had said back at the beginning that, you know, a lot of these programs, hemp is eligible or not explicitly ineligible, and, you know, hemp as a crop or hemp related business. There are very few hemp 100% focused opportunities, but in the state of New York, administered by the Empire State Development in consultation with their Department of Agriculture, there was an industrial hemp processing grant. Uh, the grants were for a minimum of $10,000 and a maximum of $500,000 for up to 50% of the total project costs. Right now, there aren't uh, funding opportunities. It's not available at present, but there's an opportunity in the future for funding for grants for machinery and equipment. And we just wanted to highlight the fact that certain states like New York and others are finally starting to look at the fact that hemp is unique. It is an agricultural commodity, but it should be treated different and creating a program that's just for it um, certainly has a benefit. We can talk about that at the end of some of the advocacy work uh, you could do to try to you know, get more opportunities for hemp and hemp businesses. Just gonna to quickly touch on a COVID-19 program specifically for Colorado. Uh, it's the Energize Colorado Gap Fund. Energize Colorado is a nonprofit. You know, we've been focusing on government agency opportunities. Just wanted to highlight one nonprofit that's trying to bring a diverse professional community together to support small businesses and specifically helping them recover from the impact of COVID-19. And you can see some of the eligibility criteria there. Similarly, in California, there is a California Disaster Relief Loan Program administered Small Business Finance Center, California's Infrastructure and Economic Development make. Bit of a mouthful there, uh, but it is a great program. It's a guarantee program that provides guarantees for loans up to 50,000 for small business borrowers and declared disasters. So a couple of qualifying criteria we've heard at this time, um, they may not be willing to make general loans to cannabis or cannabis ancillary companies. Uh, you know, unclear if hemp would qualify there as cannabis related. For the most part, hemp is treated completely different from cannabis, meaning marijuana, but you'd always want to double check your eligibility criteria before applying for anything. And I just want to hand that back over to Eric to highlight at the you know advocacy level, what's been going on with these federal COVID nineteen programs and hemp specifically? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. So um, the um, the uh, when the when the COVID nineteen hit, uh, Congress moved very quickly to put in a, a CARES Act to provide uh, help for a lot of different types of businesses. There was some money funding provided to the USDA. 
but um, they didn't move quickly to do anything uh, actually to support farmers. USDA is generally oriented towards providing types of a disaster assistance you can imagine where if crops are wiped out by weather, for example, something like that. And so COVID was a new scenario. So um, Vote Hemp, along with a coalition of state-based organizations, wrote a letter to the administrator of the SBA um, asking uh, that they include uh, farmers, hemp farmers and hemp businesses in the uh, some of the COVID programs. And uh, um, so we got a letter, we got a response back and uh, essentially saying that the FB, the SBA uh, typically didn't didn't provide support to farmers so that they didn't uh, believe that they were covered. And um, this was obviously wasn't the answer we wanted, but uh, we we used that uh, response to go to supporters in Congress and make the argument that they needed to be included in the second package. And so in the second CARES Act package, they did do that, in fact. And so it did open things up. That was a significant win for us to get hemp businesses and other farms, I think, were also included as well. So, I mean, whether or not you grew hemp, but uh, to include farmers in this COVID packages. So, um, uh, you, you know, good good example of what advocacy can do. Uh, a couple of the COVID specific things, I'll just go over real briefly. Uh, some some of those have, have, you know, money has expired, but at least there may be another package that still could come in. So there was the Small Business Administration Economic Injury Disaster Loans Program. Uh, that was uh, for businesses to, to seek loans of up to $2 million, showing that they're you know, the COVID had a, had a, had a, had a you know, major detrimental impact on their business. Um, so, and, and according to their, the SBA's internal operating procedures, loans are generally available to businesses that are include hemp. Uh, and we've seen a little bit of a, a mixed result in terms of people getting them or not getting them. So uh, I, I'm not fully sure how, how evenly this is being applied yet, but it's but uh, there are businesses that have received assistance in the hemp industry from SBA. Uh, so these loans can be used to pay fixed debts, payroll, accounts payable, and other bills uh, that couldn't be paid because of the impact from uh, COVID-19. And so uh, anyways, as I mentioned, it's, it's a little bit been on a case-by-case -case basis in terms of how this has been applied thus far. But we have seen some businesses reporting that they got help. Bone Hemp actually did a survey. We uh, we surveyed a bunch of different uh, uh, you know farmers and and people in the industry, and and specifically in this case here, we asked farmers about the drop in the farm gate price. And this will be important in a minute. We'll talk a little bit more about how that uh, uh, impact that at USDA. But we did find that there was significant impact that the farm gate prices of hemp dropped from the beginning of January this year even more. I know they dropped from last year as well, but that we saw additional losses uh, due to the price of the, of the, you know, the crops dropping over that period. And there you can see a little breakdown. Um, we, um, so here we, we asked uh, business and farmers whether or not they had applied for assistance, whether they had been accepted. And you can see there that uh, 40, you know, 64% uh, had not actually done anything on assistance. But we did find that some people had applied and were able to successfully get uh, um, assistance under either the EIDL or the Paycheck Protection Program, and so, but others were, were uh, rejected. So, um, you know, the, the, there, was, there was a little bit of a mixed result, but we were seeing that some people were being successful with it. And uh, Again, we, we kind of went a little further just asking businesses how they were impacted. And uh, so, you know, you can see there a, a range of responses. Uh, some people from, from the worst case scenario where people were put out of business and, uh, uh, you know, uh, other people that uh, weren't able to grow hemp this year or they saw their sales decrease, that type of thing. So um, another area that we aren't eligible for yet, but that could be a possibility down the road would be USDA specialty crop block grant program. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, so block block grant program is to enhance competitiveness of specialty crops. However, uh, hemp is not currently designated as a specialty crop. So that would take uh, um, something from Congress. There are some crops that look to be similar uh, so that, that we think that hemp could potentially apply to this, but it may be a, a difficult process to get that included. So that's something else we're looking to work on. And um, if, it, if hemp was designated as a specialty crop, it would open up some significant additional programs, funding, and that type of thing. So um, 
we're pretty short on time here, so I want to open it up for questions in a second. So I'll, I'll try to finish up here. Um, we also, uh, as I mentioned, the US, uh, USDA did have some money as well. They had a coronavirus food assistance program. Unfortunately, they made a determination fairly early that they decided that hemp was not going to be eligible. They claimed that the price of hemp had not declined uh, more than 5% between January and April. Uh, obviously, we had a different point of view on that, as I showed you from our, our brief survey showed that that surely was not the case, that it did decline significantly. But uh, that's where we are right now, is that that CFAP program is not available to hemp because of USDA's conclusion. If we can provide more evidence, I think we could potentially change their mind. Um, and then advocating for change, what can we do, right? So encourage the USDA to designate hemp as a specialty crop. This is something we want to we definitely want to work on, uh, but I think I actually want to work on Congress as well. Uh, as the next farm bill comes up in a couple of years, that's something we want to bring up. And then um, write your elected officials. Vote Hemp certainly provides, provides a platform for that. You can find some take action links there and some tools where you can write to your members of Congress on different issues that, uh, that are pending, including our effort to try to change the definition of hemp to uh, include up to 1% THC. And uh, you can advocate for hemp-specific grants and loans, both with within USDA and the SBA, as well as with your member of Congress. And so at this point, we'd like to go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, Michelle, if you want to take the lead, I see we have a few already in the chat area. And anybody else with questions, please post those to the chat area, and we will try our best to get to everybody. Sure, absolutely. So it looks like we got a question on whether hemp education would fit under any of these program, and P.S. Hi, Eric, uh, <laughs> from that commenter. So it looks like uh, education wouldn't necessarily fit under the least the ones we've touched on today, but, and this is going to be an infuriating answer, I, I'm sure, but you really have to check the eligibility criteria of each and every uh, grant or loan opportunity to see whether or not you could fit under that Program. I, I think there's maybe one area where it could potentially fit, and that would be if you had a for-profit education business, the SBA loans might, it might apply there. You might be able to go and if you could show that you had a for-profit business model, that you could potentially get a, a, an SBA business loan for that, uh, as long as it was for-profit. I think that's a requirement. Yeah, good point. Good Thanks, point. Tracy. Got another question. If all your income is from marijuana, can you qualify for any of these loans. Certainly the federal programs, you would be ineligible at this point. Um, you know, a lot of the paperwork as you fill out contracts with a federal agency, you need to affirm compliance with federal law. So you would not be eligible at the federal level. Individual state level, if your state has legalized adult use or medical marijuana, and that's where your revenue source, you'd have to look at the eligibility criteria. States and even local officials have gotten you know, pretty crafty in how they word their requests or their loan documents or their grant documents. So again, my answer is you're going to have to check uh, the individual application information on the state or local level, but on the federal level, unfortunately, at this time, you would not be eligible. Just scroll and see any of the other questions. Uh, so question, latest word on whether the U.S. government contracting website through GSA uh, would be including hemp. You know, I don't know specifically whether GSA has opportunities related to hemp. I think there are federal business, op you know, the federal business opportunities website post contract opportunities. And if they had something where hemp applied, let's say if you were selling hemp rope and they had an application with the Navy that needed hemp rope, you could potentially sell that, uh, you know, and there's, there's other things too that we didn't get into today. USDA has a thing called the bio preferred program and there is government purchasing preferences applied to products that are made uh, primarily from natural uh, materials. I think it's like a minimum of 80% or 85% natural materials, and those can get preferences as, uh, from government contracting. So there may be other opportunities there. Thanks, Eric. Similar question, I'm gonna to turn to you, Eric, um, on government contracting. It says from Michael, is there any indication that the federal government is looking into the use of the Defense Production Act to support the hemp sector with things like guaranteed loans? Are there any lawmakers pushing for that? I am not aware of any lawmakers pushing for use specifically of the Defense Production Act for hemp. Um, the, it was used in a fairly limited way. I think the president initially resisted 
evo invoking it, and then eventually did for things like uh, ventilators. So, but I haven't heard, excuse me, I haven't heard of anything hemp related with the DPA yet. I haven't either. But certainly back to that advocacy, you know, and asking questions of your regulator, you know, the pressure to make these things happen, you know, has to start with each of us and really reaching out to your elected official to start this dialogue. So a couple of questions from folks who are late, by the way, one, uh, we will be posting a copy of this. I think Cindy Cedarberg will send out an email to all the registrants. And so you should be able to view this if you only caught part of it or even for people who missed it. And also um, somebody asked if transportation was included. I believe if that's an operating expense, potentially could be included in areas like that where loans applied to things like operating expense. So I don't know the specifics of your question there, but that, you know, I, I would say it could be covered. Yeah, agreed. Agree with that. Uh, you know, while others are thinking of any other questions, feel free to put them in, just kind of wrap up some additional thoughts. Uh, you know, we had gone over just briefly and very generally how to apply for these, but I just want to, you know, to leave everyone with, remember to check deadlines, make sure you're actually answering the questions that are asked, you know, kind of avoid long and interrupted paragraphs, follow every instruction and double check things um, like font size or word count, really make sure you're complying, you know, these are competitive and you want to make sure your application is reviewed based on its substance and not because you used, you know, 11 point font instead of 12 point font or whatever absurd criteria there is. So really make sure that your application, whether it's for a grant or loan at the federal, state or local level, gets before the official that needs to review it because, you know, you submit it on time and you included all the information that was necessary to allow them to review your application. Let's see. It doesn't look like there are any other questions. Uh, so speak now or forever hold your peace. I think uh, <laughs> Hemp Hemp Hooray is a great, uh, yeah. great note to end on. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so really appreciate everybody taking the time to join us. Obviously, a lot of material. Can't really touch on every state, can't touch on every program, but just wanted to give you an overview and a flavor of the types of things that are out there. If you have any follow-up questions about anything discussed here or anything else hemp related, that's that's what we do. Uh, so you see the contact information for myself and Eric listed there. Definitely feel free to reach out and see how we can help. Thanks everyone. Appreciate you coming today. Thank you. Bye everyone.